Hello, as you're popping on, give me just a second and I'm going to share this to a couple places and then we'll get started. So let me, let me find the video first so I can share it. Here we go. If you're popping on, say hey, let me know where you're watching from. If you're watching on replay, let me know that also. If you're watching on YouTube, you can say hey in the comments. Just be a second and I will get us going. <clears throat> I just got home from the gym, my husband and I. So I'm a little tired, but we're doing good. Okay, so what I wanted to do is um, I really didn't have an agenda for these three days other than I want to fast and pray. And I felt like the Lord was leading me to pray for specific areas for each day. And then I felt like for the month of February, he gave me like a 29 days of prayer of specific focus for that. And I think the fasting will be a great jump start to, to jump us over into February. But for, for these three days, the focus for day one is about surrender and repentance. And I kind of want to just share from my heart some things that he's been showing me probably really the last couple years and I, you know, I didn't have an agenda for tonight and I wasn't even sure if I was just going to jump on and pray or, or if I was going to say anything other than that. And I, I've just been praying today, you know, Lord, show me what you want me to share. And so I kind of just want to take you on the journey that I've been on and some places that he's taken me and some things that he's laid on my heart. I don't know what all of it means yet. I don't know where it's all going. Some of it I do, some of it I don't, you know, whenever we are in this journey with God, there's times that he reveals something to us and we immediately know what it means and for what season it's for and what we're supposed to do with it. Other times we just have to sit back and observe and wait until he shows us exactly what it is he wants us to do with it. So I'm not going to put time frames to this because if you follow me at all, you know, I'm so bad. I could say yesterday and it was actually six months ago, but I know over the past couple years, you know, I went through deliverance in, in May, 2020 and that radically, radically changed my life. I am like a brand new person. Sometimes I look at myself and I don't even recognize who God is changing me into versus who I was. I was so bound and I was so tormented. And I also was rebellious. If, if you'd ask me back then, was I re a rebellious person? I would have said, oh no, you know, I love God and I'm serving God. Which I did love him, but I wasn't totally submitted to him. There was many areas of my life I was not submitted. I had not surrendered my past because I couldn't get over it. I hadn't surrendered my future because I was scared of my future. I was scared of what was going to happen to me. I was scared of never getting better. I was scared of if God was going to protect me. I was wrapped in fear. So I definitely wasn't surrendering my future. I was not surrendering my attitude. I was not crucifying my flesh. I was not walking in the fruit of the spirit. So there were so many areas that were not okay and were not healthy. And so it's been a journey of really walking in surrender to God and saying, okay, God, what does that look like? What does that mean? Even though I got saved at 18 and I loved God, I did not really start looking at surrender until 2020 as far as what I needed to do, what that meant. And God really has been walking me through that. And a huge part of it has just been surrendering everything to him and leaving nothing out meaning my marriage, if it's not where I need it to be, or I want it to be, or if it's not, you know, looking in the image that I thought it was going to look or, or whatever, laying that down at his feet. You know, when I first walked through deliverance, Ronnie and I, at that point, we were basically just roommates and he was my caregiver. There was not uh, any level of intimacy. There was not any level of closeness. There was a lot of hate and animosity toward each other. There was, um, a lot of bitterness, a lot of hurt. We both had hurt each other. I was super, super mean to him all the time. I called him names. It, and so when I first came out of that, I wanted it to be fixed immediately. You know, I wanted to have this amazing marriage. I felt so different inside and I wanted him to immediately just know how different I was. But there was a process and a walking through and a healing and a, a God bringing restoration. So there was a point in time where I just said, 
to God, I give you that. I give you my marriage. I give you whatever it's supposed to look like. I'm not putting any expectation on it. I'm not saying I want it to look this way. I'm saying, God, I want it to look like whatever you want it to look like. I had other relationships that I, I just wanted to be understood and for, for me to understand them and, and for them to understand me and just healing. And I, I wanted it without the process, maybe. Maybe that's part of it. I just wanted it to be done and just fixed. But in that, I had to surrender and say, God, every single one of my family members are yours. They were yours first. They belong to you. They're actually your children and your creation. And taking my hands off of them. You know, I can look at my family and say, I think it needs to be this way. I think they need to fix this. Or I think they need to w work on that. But the only one that I really can, can change is myself. And the only one I should be trying to change is myself. And so part of the surrender was saying, God, just do a work in them. Whatever that looks like. I'm not giving you my agenda. I'm not saying fix this, 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 and this. And do it in this order. And do it in this way. And use that modality. It's just laying them at his feet and saying, God, they're yours. And I just pray a hedge of protection around them. I pray that you would minister to them. I pray that you would make them who you created them to be. And I pray that you would bless them in the name of Jesus. And then getting my hands off of it. That means there's times that when he tells me to be silent, I have to be silent. I'm not their savior. I'm, I'm not their fixer. I'm not their Holy Spirit. I'm not there to, to do any of those things. There are times that God gives me something to say and I say it, but it's surrendering in every single interaction. That's a huge part of surrender because we think we know what needs to happen in situations and we think we know what way it needs to go. And we just really think that, that we know what we know when all actuality, we only see a tiny small piece of the puzzle and the puzzle of life. Like God sees every single piece. And at best, maybe we see a handful of pieces. And sometimes I think it's really arrogant of us to think. And, and this was something I had to set with. This was something that God brought to me. And it was like I was taking him off the throne and putting myself on the throne and saying, this needs to happen. That needs to happen. And I was praying prayers that way. And I was telling God how it needed to go and how it needed to happen. And when he brought that revelation to me, I was like, wow, how arrogant and manipulative was I? I was doing it from a place of love, but that still didn't make it right because I wasn't surrendered in my prayers to God. I wasn't surrendered in my relationships. So that was a big area that he started walking me through, surrendering prayer to him. So many times I think we try to bring God into our will versus us going into his will and submitting to his will. We want to tell him how life should be and what it should look like. And that's very different prayers to say, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, whatever that looks like. I'm taking my hands off of it. I'm not going to try to manipulate it. I'm not going to try to get you to, I'm not going to try to twist your arm. I'm not going to try to tell you how it should be. It's very, very different prayers. And there's so much peace when we can get to a place of just saying, God, your will be done. Why is there peace? Because his will is perfect. His plans are perfect and ours are not. If we are constantly trying to walk out our plan and our will, we are going to be up, down, left, right, all over the place. And who knows what kind of mess we're going to make. But when we can truly surrender and say, God, God, your will, not mine, we can come into a place of being in his perfect will and his perfect plan and his perfect timing. And we can rest and have peace. We don't have to try to figure it out. We don't have to make anything happen. We don't have to worry about our family. We can really give them to him. And whatever they're walking through, have peace knowing that his will will be done in the name of Jesus. And so that is what surrender looks like in practical application. Maybe it's like a family member that, that you know, I, well, I have family that I love dearly and I see them walk through very, very difficult seasons. And I want to take that on for them and I want to carry that for them. And I don't want them to have to walk through those times, but I don't know what God is going to use in their life. I don't know what circumstance or situation, you know, I have a family member right now that from the outside looking in, it doesn't look great. It doesn't look like what I thought it should look like. 
And the Lord spoke to me a few days ago and he said, don't you think I can use anything? And I was like, wow, God, yeah. I wasn't acting like it and I wasn't believing that, but yeah, I do. I believe that you can use anything. And it's just another level of surrender of saying, God, you know, it doesn't matter what my physical eyes are seeing. I choose to walk by the spirit, not by my flesh, not by my emotions, not what I'm seeing in the natural. I choose to put my eyes on you and I choose to walk by faith and I choose to surrender to you. Now, does it usually be a one and done? No, it's usually a over and over and over. It's a relinquishing of our will. It's a relinquishing and a choosing. It's not an emotion. We're not, we're not looking at emotion. We're full of emotions. Are we going to feel like we want to surrender? No, absolutely not. Is it going to feel like the opposite of what we want to do? Yeah, pretty much, probably almost every single time. That's why we aren't guided by our emotions. It's a choice. We choose to say, God, I trust you and I surrender to you. You know, there's a prayer that I say many mornings and it's just, God, I surrender today to you. I surrender my life to you. I surrender this ministry to you. We can get so caught up even in doing ministry that we start making plans and we start saying we're going to do this or we're going to do that. And we get so far ahead of God, we're not even asking him, God, what do you want me to do? God, what do you want this ministry to look like? Where do you want me to go with this ministry? What have you called me to do? We, we can do that with a job, with relationships. So many times we enter into relationships, friendships, even not even romantic relationships, but friendships. And we didn't even ask God, did you send that person to my life or did they come from the enemy? Is this a relationship you want? And pretty soon we can see ourselves in a big old hot mess because we've not asked him. Our church, the churches we attend, God, what church do you want me at? Where do you want me? How do you want me there? How do you want me to serve there? It really is a lifestyle of surrender, surrender, surrender. And it starts with us. It starts with each and every one of us. That to me is foundational to any type of change. It's foundational to, you know, in the in many churches, we hear about revival and God pouring out his spirit and such anticipation but i think i think before we experience god's blessing and god's favor and god's mercy and god's grace outpouring like like overtaking us surrender is foundational you know i started reading i don't even know when this was it started standing out to me the last read through that i was doing of the bible so probably it would have been, um, I'm in the New Test, our Old Testament again, but it, it happened in 2023. So as I was reading through, I kept catching every single time God said, if you do this, I will bless you. And he was talking to the children of Israel. He was talking to his children that he pulled out and he created um, this group of people to be his. They were his children. And he kept telling them, if you obey me, go into the Old Testament and look how many times he talks about that. If you obey me, I will bless you. If you obey me, I will not, um, I will keep my hand on you. I will keep you safe. You will experience my favor. But what is the flip side of that? Like the flip side is what happened to the Egyptians, what happened in the plagues, what happened every time the children of Israel stepped outside of God's, of obeying God. Look what happened to them every single time. And yet in America and in our world and in our churches, we've lost that knowledge of if we obey God, if we follow his commands, if we do what he says to do, if we walk in obedience comes his blessing. We want the blessing. We're all about his blessings. We're all about his grace. We're all about his mercy. And we've kind of set aside that if we obey him and he's really been standing, that's been standing out to me that that's not changed. He is the God of yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. He's unchanging. He wants us to obey him. That was his one thing over and over and over in the Old Testament. Obey me, obey me, obey me. He wants children that will obey him. He is a good and loving parent. And everything that he does is to bring us back to obedience. So in my opinion, the place to start in everything is in surrender. Every area of our life, surrender and obey. To me, the two go hand in hand. If you're surrendered to God, you're going to be obeying him. So to me, I use them interchangeably. Surrender, obey, surrender, obey. And so I, I started noticing that as a major trend that I was seeing. 
and, and within that, I really started taking a look at the American church and I started looking at America in general. When my husband and I were going to um, Louisiana, I don't know, it's been over a year ago, maybe a year and a half, I don't know. We were on the way there and I wasn't really thinking about a whole lot. I was just sitting in the car and I heard the Lord speak to me and he said, a chasm is coming. I've never used that word in my life. I'm probably not even schasm, chasm, schism. I had to look it up. I probably don't even say it right. I didn't even know what the word meant. But when he said it was coming, I knew it was like a split and a divide because of what he said. He said, there's going to be two groups in the church. One group is going to be the ones who feel like that they're doing everything right, but they're really not serving him. They're not, they're not living a surrendered life. They're not living a biblical life. They are doing everything contrary to the word of God, but they're, they're a Christian and label only. And then there will be the other group who is the group that is living biblical lives and who's really seeking him and they want to live a surrendered life and they want to follow him. And there's going to be a huge divide between the two groups. And that group is going to be attacking the group that really wants to follow after God. And that's where a lot of the infighting is going to be coming from. That's where a lot of the divide is coming from. And that's where a lot of the, the, the just really nasty attacks. So I looked up that word to see. I'm like, I don't even know what it means. I don't, I'm sure I don't even say it right with my southern accent and my pronunciation. So I, I looked it up. And it had two definitions. One was, and if I remember, it was like when the earth splits. Like, you know how sometimes you will see the ground, it's just split, like in two. And like, you can look down and you can see, like, it, it's a big crack. That's one. And the other is a big, massive divide in ideology, thought, thoughts, and viewpoints. And so, whenever he gave me that, and I looked that up, I had already started seeing a lot of that. I had already been noticing how on social media that Christians eat each other alive and how that we are worse than the world in a lot of ways. We name call, we are so hateful, and it's not even over, most of the time, it's not even over salvation issues. It's over what, um, what translation of the Bible do you read? Or, you know, do you believe this or do you believe that? It's not even, it's not even salvation issues. And the lack of respect for each other, the lack of love. You know, I, I think about love in, in, in the Bible, the definition of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is enduring. And sorry, every time I put my thumb up, I forget that that little bubble goes up on the video. Um, it doesn't look anything like that. It looks hateful, it looks nasty, it looks ugly, it looks like you're going to believe my way because no other way is better, it looks unteachable, it looks like a bunch of demons tearing themselves apart through the church is exactly what it looks like. And I see what it looks like to me, and I'm a Christian, and I love God, and I love God's people, and I love God's church. And I know how it makes me feel. So I wonder what it makes the world feel like when they see us all over social media acting that way with each other. What do they think about us? Why would they ever want anything that we have? Why would they ever want to reach out to one of us? Why would they ever want to step inside a church house? We're worse than they are in many ways. And that's the church. So then I started looking at more. And more things just started being highlighted to me, like the condition of today's contemporary church. And I'm not talking about any one denomination. I'm not talking about any one church. I'm talking about the church as a whole. And I just started seeing all of these stories. And I mean, I know the stories have always been there, but it's like the Lord was just really highlighting it because it became a burden that I prayed about a lot. There were times the burden for the church was so strong, I could barely talk. I could just say, Jesus. Jesus, wake up your church. Wake up your church. I started seeing stories about all of the abuse that's coming out and how it's trying to be covered up and how people are defending pastors that are abusive, how pastors are covering, covering up sexual abuse, but then people are defending them. Just this week, or last couple weeks, I've seen things be defended that I think even 10 years ago would have never been defended 
in the church. The world, absolutely. 100% the world, yes. But not in the church. It has really gotten to the place where there's a very, very fine line, if any, between us and the church, or the world, between the, the church and the world. There are churches that you can go to that look like nightclubs. There are churches that you can go to that support alternative lifestyles and say that it's not a sin. There are churches you can go to that promote abortion. There are churches that you can go to that um, the pastors are mega, mega churches and they are steeped in scandal. And it's come out places where they've been and places that they've visited that a pastor or a man of God has no place being. There are mega churches where they are supporting music that is about everything that is ungodly. And yet the church says, it's okay. We're not supposed to judge. We're not supposed to look at that. We're not, we're not supposed to call them out. Everything is about grace. Everything is about mercy. The church is in trouble in many ways. I'm not saying the whole thing. There are there. God will always have a remnant and he will always have people that are praying and that are seeking him and that love him and that are in his word. But I'm talking about the globe, like the, the big, uh, I was going to say global, but I don't know what's going on in other nations. I know what's going on in America. That's usually what I follow is what's going on here because I live here. When the world doesn't be, when the world can't tell us apart, you know, there's an issue. And then I start thinking about all the people that, that are in those congregations and they are birthing Christians out of these congregations that they're never taught what holy living is and they're never taught about a real relationship with God and they're never taught what the Bible means and, and what obedience to God means, like what it really means to obey God. That's where you hear messages like follow your heart, do what's in your heart, do what feels right. God is full of love, so no matter what you do, he's just going to love you. You know, I've even seen things where it's like, well, God winks at that. God thinks it's funny. God thinks it's cute. That is not the God of the Bible. I don't see one scripture that supports that God thinks sin is cute. I see scriptures that say God hates sin. He hates sin. He's still the same God that he's always been. So all of these things have been stirring in my heart. I've been seeing these things, I've been watching these things, and I'm like, okay, God, you know, what are we supposed to do? And what I hear over and over and over is wake up. It is time for his people to wake up. We have been in a slumber. We have had our head in the sand. We have been so wrapped up in our own problems and our own issues and our own families and our own bondage that the church is crumbling and falling apart in so many areas. It is time for us to wake up. It is time for us to be bold and to stand and to proclaim the gospel of the Bible. It's time for us to teach the gospel of the Bible and teach the God of the Bible and pray and pray and pray. And it's time for us to surrender. It's time for us to go into deep repentance on behalf of our churches on behalf of our nation stand before God and say I'm sorry Lord I'm sorry that we missed the mark and we we as Christians the ones who should have stopped it that we have allowed abortion that we have allowed the pornography that is being produced out of this nation that we've allowed the trafficking that that happens to the children of this nation that we have allowed everything that we've allowed in the school system Everything that we allow on our televisions, God, we're sorry. It's time for us to stand in the gap. And it's time for us to wake up and, and push back. Push the enemy back. This is our nation. And if we're not praying and we're not trying to change things, who is going to do it? Who is going to do it? You know, I think we spend so much time complaining. Can we believe how this is going? Can you believe how that's going? We get on social media. We fight for our political party. We fight about the leadership. We fight about this. And let me say, there is no political party that's going to save us. Our salvation comes from God and God alone. Our salvation. Now, I'm not saying we support things that are ungodly. That's not what I'm saying at all. And this is not about politics. But I see so many putting their hope in people. Our hope is not in people. Our hope is in God. He is the only one that can turn this thing around. He is the only one that can make change. 
And I tell you, I think we are headed for very, very difficult times and very, very difficult days if we are not on our knees praying and seeking God and begging for his mercy, begging for his forgiveness, begging for his righteousness and making a change in our homes and turning them back into godly homes, turning our churches back into godly churches, turning our communities into godly communities and turning this nation back toward God. If we don't do that, I think it's going to get really bad. I do. I think that we are on a trajectory for darkness to get darker and darker and darker. And we can get into fear. We can get into bondage and say there's nothing we can do. We can pray and we can fast. And that moves the heart of God. We can surrender. We can walk in obedience. Obedience gets God's attention. You know, I seen a meme the other day and it said God's love language is obedience. And I think that's true. I think that is so accurate. And it starts with each one of us. We can stand to the side and continue wringing our hands and saying, oh God, what, what can we do? What, what can we do? It takes each one of us individually and banded together to make change. And it starts with surrendering our lives and surrendering ourselves to God. So I just want you to start thinking about your life. I want you to start thinking about where you're at personally. Where is your level of surrender? What are the things in your life? Because we all have them. We are none of us perfect. None of us are Jesus. Uh, it would be nice if we could get to that level and just stay there and never have a worry in the world, but it's not like that. Our flesh fights it. The demonic fights it. Everything fights against surrender. Uh, I did a whole video on Facebook, or I'm sorry, on YouTube about surrender. If you guys want it, let me know. I'll post it. It's not easy. It is a process and it is a choice and it is working at it. But what area in your life have you not surrendered to God? Is it fear of the future? Is it fear of your finances? Is it a pattern of sin? Is there a sin that you just have not been willing to let go of? Is it your marriage? Is it your children? Is it your ministry? Is it that you're refusing to step into the calling God has given you? Has he been telling you, I want you to do this and you've been dragging your feet? Because even, I seen something the other day and I can't remember exactly what it said, but it said when God speaks and, our de and we delay, that's rebellion. And I believe that 100%. When God speaks, our only answer is yes, Lord. In your timing, yes, Lord. And if he tells us to do something and we refuse to do it or we won't do it right now, it's rebellion. I've been there. I've done that many times. It's rebellion. It's absolutely rebellion. I'm walking through a season with my health, and I'm going to share about that before too long. And part of it is because I was rebellious in getting started. I kept saying, okay, God, I'll, I will. I'll get to it. But it was rebellion, and he revealed it to me. Anytime we lag or anytime we don't start doing what he says to do or we don't stop doing what he says to do, it's rebellion. So is there any areas of your life you've not surrendered to him? And I want to talk about repentance for a minute because I think so many times we get repentance confused. We think if we're just sorry, you know, then that, that makes everything okay. I can remember when I got saved. Again, I was 18. I'm 45 now, so it was many years ago. Um, many years ago, it feels like. I, I felt like I was just a baby back then. But when, we, when, when I got saved, I was led through what us in churches call a sinner's prayer. And I don't want to even say, like, I meant it. It wasn't that I didn't mean it. I did mean it. I did want God to come in and change me. And, and I was sorry. But I wasn't taught back then what repentance really even means. It means having a change of heart, mind, and direction. That means you change. You stop. You stop with the patterns of sin. You stop being rebellious. When you are in repentance, it's more than just saying, God, I'm sorry. We can tell him every single day. We can get up and live a whole life full of patterns of sin and be like, God, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, I messed up, and then just go right back to it. That's not really repentance. Repentance means having a change of heart, mind, and direction. So that means we break that pattern, we stop, and we try to do better. We use it as a lesson, we grow, we mature, and we do better. Now, are we going to get it right? No, we're going to mess up. Again, we're not Jesus. We're, we're people. But that does not give us a free pass. Grace never gave us a free pass to sin. That was never the, the intent of grace. It was never about how much sin can I get away with and still make it to heaven. That, that's not um, 
shouldn't even be on our radar, but I think many times it is. What can I get away with? It's not that big of a deal. Those are lies of the enemy. If you're stuck in that, command the enemy to be silent in the name of Jesus. Get in the Bible. Get in the Word. Break that off of you. Grace is not a license to sin. It catches us when we fall. It is like our, um, I was thinking about, you know, the net, like when they walk on the high wire and they fall off the high wire and the net catches them. That's more what grace is. So we have to change. We have to want to change. We have to hate sin as much as God hates it. We have to get to a place where we don't want to live sinful lives. You know, we should not be somewhere in our lives where we are saying, okay, what's the line I can walk? What line can get me into heaven, but I can still have fun in the world, you know, kind of straddle that line. The Word of God says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? We don't have fellowship with darkness, and if we do, there's because there's not enough light in us, and there's an issue within us. So I want to encourage you, start looking at areas of your life that needs repentance, areas that need surrender. Start with you. Don't start trying to fix everybody in your house. Don't start trying to fix your church. Don't start trying to fix your community. Start with you. It always, always, always starts with us. I posted something the other day, and a friend of mine said, that stomped on my toes. That's an old church saying. You know, if the, if the pastor's preaching and, and you feel conviction, oh, he stomped on my toes. And I said, my toes stay, stay stomped off. <laughs> like, my toes stay stomped. Because there's always something to work on in us. And I'm not talking about being critical about ourselves and, and all beating ourselves up. But I'm talking about looking more like Jesus. Looking more like him, striving to look more like him, striving to be more like him. That should be our goal. That should be what we're trying to attain and what we're trying to reach. Try and think if there's anything else I want to say tonight. I definitely want to pray with everybody. I hope the fast is going well for you guys. Fasting is not easy. It's not a fun thing. It's not like, woohoo, we get to fast. Um, or at least I don't feel that way about it. Uh, I would love to say I do. It, it's, it's definitely hard. But it's well worth it. And it brings our flesh into submission. It brings it to submission to God. And so I would encourage you to make fasting a regular part of your life. Be consistent with it. So I just want to pray with you guys. If you're watching this on replay or you're watching it now, I want you to pray too. Whenever I pray, I always try to be led by the Holy Spirit. I never want to pray my words. You know, there's a lot of things that I see that I think need to happen, but I don't care what I think needs to happen. I want to pray the perfect will of God. And I'm not saying I always get it right. I'm not saying that I'm always like in a place where I'm listening like I should be or I'm following exactly as I should be. But in prayer, I always, always, always try to be led by the Holy Spirit in exactly what to pray. There's times that you may hear me start praying and then all of a sudden I just stop and go a different direction. And that's why I'm trying to follow him. I don't want him to follow me. And I think even in our own prayer lives, like in private when we're praying, I do the exact same thing. I want to pray the will of God. I want to pray what God wants me to pray. There's times that I don't even know what to say. So I'll say, God, what do you want me to pray? And then I wait and I listen. And again, there's other times, like if there's an urgent need and I know that there's a family member that's sick, of course, I'm just going to pray and say, God, I pray that you would, you would heal them, move in their life, have your way and those types of things. But when I'm really in my prayer time and I'm trying to get on the mark of God's perfect will, I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. So sometimes if you, if you listen to me pray, it may be a little different just because I'm trying to listen to what he wants me to say. So let's pray. So, Father God, right now I praise you and I bless you and I thank you for your goodness, God. I just want to take a moment to get quiet and I want to get still. I don't want to rush this. I don't want to get in a hurry. I don't want to miss you. I don't want to miss your timing. I don't want to miss your will. I don't want to miss what you want to speak and what you want us to pray. God, I glorify you and I magnify you and I give you praise. God, I thank you that you see each and every one of us. Nothing is unnoticed by you. You care about every single one of us. You care about every detail of our life. You care about every single interaction we have. And you are such a personable God. You're so individual. And Lord, you are always, always, always moving in our lives. 
God, I pray that we would be more aware of your presence. I pray that, we'd be, that we would be more aware of lining our lives up with your will. I pray that we would be more aware of coming into agreement with your will, Father. I pray that we would begin to make that a lifestyle, that we would begin to be checked and stop and say, okay, God, what is your will? For every decision that we make, for every job, for every relationship, for every move, for every ministry, for every calling, I pray that we would begin to seek you and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do in this situation? And I pray that we would begin to stop and not make decisions until we hear your answer or we feel your answer or we feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Lord, right now, I just pray for each and every one of us watching that you would begin showing us areas of our lives that is not surrendered to you. Maybe it's our time. Maybe we spend way too much time on social media, or we spend too much time watching television, or we spend too much time just wasting time, doing nothing with it. Maybe it's our marriages. Maybe we spend so much time worrying and wondering and thinking or looking at somebody else's marriage and saying, I wish I had that, I would love to have that. Or, or maybe it's us trying to fix our spouse, sitting around thinking, how can I fix them? What can I do to them? Maybe it's our family members who we see everything wrong in them that needs to fix, that they need to fix, but we fail to look at our own issues. Maybe it's our coworkers or or maybe it's a pattern of sin that we've justified and said, you know, it's not that big a deal or God, you understand. Or maybe it's something that we've just not wanted to let go of. Maybe we have some idols in our life that need to be tore down. Maybe there's things in our life that take your place. Maybe there's things in our life that are number one and you're not number one anymore. God, whatever those areas are, I pray that you would begin to reveal it to each and every one of us. Maybe it's our past. Maybe our past is holding us hostage, saying that we can never break free, that we're sick or that we're mentally ill or that we'll never be good enough or we can never speak or we can never teach or we can never break free. Maybe it's that. Maybe it holds us in such bondage that we can't see anything past our own hurt. God, whatever it is, I pray that you would begin to reveal to each and every one of us what area we need to surrender to you. Maybe it's eating. Maybe we have addiction to food. Maybe we have addiction to chemicals. Maybe we have addiction to alcohol. Maybe it's addiction to cigarettes or any other type of nicotine. Maybe you've been speaking and Lord, we've refused to lay it down. God, whatever it is, I pray that right now you would speak. I pray you would speak to your children. Maybe it's a legalism. Maybe we've been so bound with doing our own good works that we forgot that we're saved by grace, that it is a free gift from Jesus Christ, and that we're saved by his righteousness. Maybe we're trying to earn our own righteousness. Maybe we're wearing ourselves out, working and working and working and trying to earn your favor. Maybe we're living by man-made rules. Maybe we've even called them biblical, but they're man-made rules. Maybe it's fear that nothing's ever going to change or fear that the, that relationship is not going to be reconciled or fear of what's going to happen to America or fear of what happens in the next election. Maybe it's just fear in general. God, I pray right now, whatever you're showing each and every individual, that we as a group, as a community, as believers, as your people, as your children, would lay those things down right now at your feet. And Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I lay down every area of my life to you, Father. I lay down fullness of joy ministry. I lay down my marriage. I lay down my children. I lay down my family. I lay down my future. I lay down my past. I lay down everything at your feet, Father. And I say, have your way, God. Have your way. Have your will. Use me, move in me, change me, mold me, make me more like you, Father God. Break off anything in me that's not from you. If I need to go in the fire, put me in the fire, but remove anything from me that is not from you. And I surrender to your will, Father. I surrender to your timing. I surrender to your purpose. God, right now I pray for our families. God, I pray that they would surrender. I pray that each individual in our families would surrender to you. 
I pray that they would have a real encounter with you, that they could not deny that you are God, that you are Savior, that you are the creator of everything. Father God, I pray that you would send them dreams about you. I pray that wherever they go, they are overtaken by people witnessing to them about you. I pray on social media, at their jobs, at their schools, in their communities, that everywhere they go, everywhere they turn, they start seeing you, that they see on t-shirts sayings about you, that they hear it in music, that they see it on the television, that they hear people talking about you, that it would just be around them every single where, every single place that they turn, that they could not outrun you, Father. Lord, I pray right now that you would bind every spirit of lies that is attaching our family members, God, in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would bind every lie in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And God, I pray that you would loose your spirit of truth to set every mind free in Jesus' name. Your word says we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. So God, right now I pray that your truth would go out and set our family members free, Father God. The ones that are in bondage, the ones that see no hope, the ones that are so far from you, the ones that have drifted, the ones that's never been with you. Every single prodigal, I pray that you would go into the pig pen and lose your spirit of truth to wake them up in the name of Jesus. Just like you stood outside of Lazarus' grave and you said, Lazarus, come forth. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would stand outside of their spiritual grave and say, come forth in the name of Jesus. I pray you would wake them up out of their spiritual slumber. I pray that they would not sleep for one more moment, Lord. I pray that their chains would start rattling because they're breaking in the name of Jesus. I pray you would break addiction. I pray you would pray, break sexual addiction. I pray you would break every lie off of their lives. I pray that they would see the identity that you have given them. I pray that they would feel your peace, that they would feel your presence, that they would feel your love, that they would feel you drawing them to them, drawing them to you, Father, in Jesus name. I pray that they would walk in the identity that you have given them, who you created them to be. I pray that you would begin peeling off every single lie on their identity that the enemy has tried to place there, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, right now I pray for our churches. God, I pray that you would wake your church up. I pray that every lukewarm congregation would wake up in the name of Jesus. I pray that every lukewarm pastor and minister that shares the gospel, I pray that they would wake up. I pray that you would give them visions. I pray that you would give them dreams. I pray that you would give them strong prophetic words to wake them up in the name of Jesus. And God, for every wolf that is in sheep's clothing, I pray that you would remove them from that platform, Father God, so that a real shepherd can take their place, Lord, that would lead your people to you in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that we would be the body of Christ that we were created to be. I pray that you would take us back to the original intent, the original intent in the book of Acts, God, that church that you birthed, that was on fire, that walked in signs, wonders, and miracles. God, I pray that we would return to that church. I pray that we would return to being those people, Father God, that spoke with boldness, that was not afraid to tell the truth, that was not afraid to operate in your spirit, that was not afraid of, of being politically correct. Father God, I pray that you would lose your spirit of truth to set us free from every deception, every lie, every unclean spirit, Every, yeah, every unclean spirit, God, that has infiltrated your church, I pray, pray that we would recognize it for what it is in the name of Jesus. Everyone that is hiding, every, every lie of deception, I pray that you would uncover in the name of Jesus. I pray that we would walk in discernment so that we would know what is of you and what is not of you, Father God. I pray that we would stop accepting stuff as godly just because they say it's godly but lord that we would line it up with your word and say does it line up and that we would walk in discernment and if it's not from you that we would separate from it immediately in the name of jesus god i pray for our country god i pray that that you would forgive us for the things that we've allowed to happen in the united states God, I pray that you would forgive us for allowing abortion to continue. God, I pray that you would forgive us for allowing the sexual sin that runs rampant, the sexual sin that we normalize every single day. 
God, I pray that you would forgive us for that. God, I pray that you would forgive us for how we have kicked you out of the schools and out of the judicial system. God, I pray that you would forgive us for turning our back on you. God, right now we stand in the gap and we repent on behalf of our nation and say, God, forgive us. God, forgive us. Lord, I stand for personal repentance and I stand for repentance in the church and I stand for repentance in this nation. And God, I say, forgive us. Forgive me for not doing my part, God. There were many times I was not doing my part. And I repent for that, Father God. And I pray that you would forgive each and every one of us. God, forgive us. Cleanse us from unrighteousness. Lord, we humble ourselves now. And we pray that you would hear us and that you would heal our land, Father God. That you would heal our nation, God. That we would turn back to be the people of God you created us to be, Lord. I pray right now, Lord, in closing, that you would touch each heart and give each one of us direction. God, you have purpose and plan for each and every one of us. You have specific plans. You have specific assignments. You have desires that you want each one of us to walk in. And God, I pray that you would reveal that now. I pray that you would begin revealing that, that we would be who you created us to be and that we would each and every one answer the call that you've placed on us. In the name of Jesus. Anything else? Lord, I just pray that you would release your peace upon your people. God, we're going through times that if we look too much to the news or we look too much to social media, that fear is trying to just overtake us. God, I pray that you would raise up a standard against the spirit of fear. And I pray that you would release your peace. Father, I pray that you would bind fear and loose your peace amongst your people, Father God. We should be the ones that the world can turn to and that can find your peace. But God, so many of us are bound by fear ourselves. God, I pray that you would set your children free from the spirit of fear and loose your peace upon your children, Father. That we would walk in your peace knowing that no matter what happens, you are God. You are in control. Nothing takes you by surprise. You are God. Father, right now I give you all the praise and all the glory. In the name of Jesus, I pray all of these things. Amen. Okay, everybody. I um, have no idea if, if I will just be praying tomorrow or if I will be sharing anything. I don't know exactly what time I will pop on tomorrow. It will just be... Um, when I can get time in my schedule. And I plan on going live every day, at least to pray. Maybe um, other things, depends on how the Lord leads. For the month of February, I plan on every day at least posting scriptures or prayers or going live. I'm going to do something every single day for all 29 days of February or 29 days of prayer. If you have not signed up for that yet, I will put the link in the comments for the event in, in this live video so you guys can click going. Um, appreciate your guys' participation. I think prayer is our biggest weapon, and I think it's so underutilized. And no matter where we're at in life, no matter what we're facing, prayer is one thing we can all do. And I think it's uh, many times the one thing that we kind of overlook. And we need to get back to being people of prayer. Very much simplicity. The simplicity of biblical disciplines. Reading the Bible and praying. So I love you all. You guys have a blessed evening. And we'll talk soon. If you need anything, message me. My inbox is always open. You can comment on this wherever you're watching it. Be blessed, y'all.